Hello, and welcome back to another Monster Monday, a series where I draw a creature from D&D and I talk about its lore and its history and what it's like to fight in-game as well. As always, today's video is based on one of your suggestions left down in the comment section below. If you have a monster that you'd like to see me draw and talk about, make sure to head to the comment section, leave your favourite monster, and I'll add it to my to draw list. But then, your suggestions are voted on by my patrons over on Patreon, who get to pick which monsters they'd like to see me draw in what order. So if you want to have a bit more control over which monsters you see next, if you want to help me make these videos every single week, or you just wanted to tip me the price of a cup of coffee, I'd urge you to head over to Patreon and check out the various backer levels there. It all really helps to make this channel grow and allows me to do this every single week for you. So thank you very, very much if you choose to do that. Now, today's video has been very, very long requested by Tigerus44, Tigerus44, and they didn't actually specifically request this video, but they've been very, very eager, commenting on almost every single one of my videos, asking to see just anything Slavic, please. Any Slavic monsters that I can put in here. And recently, I threw today's video, Baba Yaga, at my players. In fact, she killed one of my party, unfortunately says the DM with a Cheshire Cat grin across his face. But she's Slavic, I love her history and I love her mythology and I thought she'd be an appropriate creature to cover and meet Tigress's request for something Slavic. So I hope you enjoy today's video. Когда мы снова встретимся в гром молнии или в дождь, когда суета сделана, когда битва проиграна и выиграна, это будет до захода солнца, где место на пустоши, там встретится с Макбет. Now, many of you will have heard of the name Baba Yaga, perhaps through the Slavic legend itself, through John Wick's devilish nickname to those who fear his wrath, or perhaps where she featured as an antagonist in Mike Mignola's fantastic Hellboy comics. But I know just as many of you will be saying, new monster who dis, because she's not actually featured in 5th edition's Monster Manual. For her stats and rules in 5th edition, I'll be using Kobold Press's fantastic Creature Codex, a wonderful compendium of unlikely, insidious, and dastardly creatures. But Baba Yaga, or at least her bizarre home, has been a part of Dungeons & Dragons proper since 1979. Her iconic hut, whose depictions you've likely seen, appeared in the Dungeon Master's Guide back then as an artifact. It's a small, crooked shack perched upon two enormous chicken legs, which it uses to stride through the marshes and bogs of the wilderness. Baba herself first made an appearance in Dungeon Magazine issue 53, but was much more fleshed out in the famous Dancing Hut adventure which featured in 1984's Dragon Magazine issue 83. So she has a long history with D&D, but who or what is Baba Yaga? Well, Baba Yaga, pronounced Baba Yaha in the Ukrainian dialect at least. I think Russians may voice the ga part. Anyway, Baba Yaga is an ancient supernatural being in Slavic folklore, whose first written appearance featured in Mikhail Lomonosov's 1755 book Rosiskia Grammatica, or Russian Grammar, where she appears in a list of Slavic gods. But it's likely that stories of Baba Yaga have travelled with the collective consciousness of the Slavic people for centuries before this through word of mouth storytelling. But what is she the god of, I hear you ask? Well, her name, split into two parts, means midwife, sorceress, or fortune teller in Old Russian, and influenced modern Russian so heavily that the Baba part formed the root of Babushka, meaning grandmother, a nickname actually used for Baba Yaga herself. You can call her the grandmother. The Yaga part has no defined etymological origin, so no one can say for sure, but the impact of legends of this creature have influenced languages over the generations to the extent that in Serbo-Croatian it means horror, shudder, or chill. In Slovenian it means anger, and in Polish it means evil woman or fury. So putting that together, what is Baba Yaga the goddess of? Well, she's the goddess of sorceress fury, of witches, 
an evil woman, but also your granny. She is the grandmother of all witches. In fact, it's Baba Yaga's appearance that has influenced the stereotypical depiction of witches and hags throughout history. Most of the time, she appears as a frankly horrifying and grotesque old woman with a long, hooked nose and filth-covered skin. And although my words cannot do justice to the nightmare fuel that the name Baba Yaga is supposed to strike in young Slavic hearts, she's supposed to be like the kind of horror that lurks in the bedroom doorway of Guillermo del Toro when he's having a sleep paralysis fever dream. So iconic is her visage that the very notion of the crooked nose belonging to a crone riding a broom takes influence from our granny. She has a set of iron teeth which click and chatter of their own accord while she talks and which she uses to grind up the bones of children as she eats them. Oh, I'm sorry, didn't I mention that she eats children? Because she eats children. But in fact, the whole broom riding thing may have originated with Baba Yaga as well. She rides around on a massive flying mortar and pestle, implements still used to grind herbs today, but would especially be associated with alchemy and magic back in the day. And she sweeps away any evidence of her visits or tracks with a broom made of silver birch. It's said that a foul smell on the air could be a sign of her presence as the mud and blood-stained clothing and her diseased skin and the decomposing meat of children clings between her rusting teeth and fills the air with rot. Sometimes, however, she is depicted as three separate sisters all at once, displaying different aspects of her personality as, a, as her magic is so strong that she shifts shape. This depiction was featured most recently in the incredible Witcher Wild Hunt game in 2015, and the original version of Baba Yaga appearing as three people appears in Alexander Afanasyev's 19th century version of the Maiden Tsar story. Ivan, the merchant's son, encounters Baba Yaga in the form of three beautiful sisters, but she's just as frequently depicted as a young and alluring woman, a caring and matronly mother, and also an older and wiser woman, more like the old crone. And this is because Baba Yaga in these stories is not inherently an evil character, despite her feared reputation and her propensity to, you know, eat children, which is reflected in her chaotic neutral alignment in-game, but she's so well known for appearing as a triplicate that tales of Baba Yaga, her three personalities, are said to be the influence for Shakespeare's three crones in the play Macbeth, which is what you heard at the beginning of this video. But just like the crones in Macbeth, she's not necessarily inherently evil, as I say. She often appears as what's called a donor in fairy tales, someone who tests the protagonist but ultimately provides magical assistance as long as her weird rules are met. And generally the consensus is, as long as you abide by these rules and you're not too delicious looking, her motives are generally ambiguous because as well as being absolutely horrifying, she has this kind of fondness and nurturing nature when it comes to the old world, the natural world the creatures of the forest, and the vulnerable. But as a result of these kind of caring, natural features and also her terrifying wrath, she's often seen as a representation of the uncaringness of nature itself, something that can provide resources, food, shelter, and so on, but just as easily it can be unsettling, scary, or kill you on a whim. As a result, her favor should always be sought with great respect, but also with trepidation. If you've ever found yourself lost in a swamp and find yourself in dire need of shelter or help, you may discover her chicken-legged hut in a muddy clearing, the lamplight burning through the window, enticing you inside from the harsh elements outside. But as a final warning that what dwells within the hut is no more sympathetic than the elements outside, you will need to cross the threshold of her property, which is marked by a ring of skulls mounted on posts. You may see a faint glow in their eyes and mouths as you approach, or perhaps their jaws will chatter in the wind. This is your last opportunity to think carefully about your decisions. As you open her front door, the smells of herbs and spices of garlic, wood fires, and warm borscht should hit you alongside rotting flesh that'll drift across your nose like a silk curtain, and you will finally be met face to face with Granny in one of her many forms. She will then ask you, 
принуждение, мои добрые юноша. Or, in English, are you here of your own free will? Or, by compulsion, my good youth. If you answer that you are, she will deal with you for good or ill. If you answer no, then it's anyone's guess. She may boot you from her house or choose to invoke her wrath on those that compel you to be here if she takes pity on you. So what does that all look like in D&D? Well, the ancient goddess of witches and of wild magic is not to be trifled with. She's a challenge rating 20 creature with 18 natural armor and 47 D8 plus 188 hit points. She can fly at 40 feet if she's in her mortar and pestle, or run at 30. She's pretty much resistant to any attacks that aren't magical. She's immune to necrotic damage and to being frightened or poisoned. And on top of all that, she has a 120 foot true sight, so nothing will escape the gaze of Granny. Further to that, she has something called Crone Sight, which acts very, very much like a Nothic's vision. She has advantage on wisdom perception checks that rely on sight, and as an action she can observe a target and know its emotional state. It fails a very, very difficult charisma saving throw. She also knows the creature's alignment and discovers a hidden secret about that target. She has crone speech, which means that creatures of intelligence 3 or lower unquestioningly obey Baba Yaga. And her teeth, as I mentioned, they chatter of their own accord, are their own creatures in this. They can fly out of her mouth if she needs to have some backup and have their own stat sheet and list of attacks. She's a legendary creature, affording her legendary actions and legendary resistance, meaning that three times a day, uh, if she fails a saving throw, she can choose to succeed instead. One of her legendary actions, of which she gets three, is to cast a spell, one of her at-will spells. She's a spellcaster which uses wisdom as their spellcasting ability which is terrifying because her wisdom is 22, her spell save DC is 20, and her spells are a plus 12 to hit. Her list of at-will abilities include Eldritch Blast, which deals 2d10 damage, Message, Minor Illusion, or Spare the Dying. But she can also cast things like Animate Objects, Insect Plague, Polymorph, Blight, Banishment, Lightning Bolt, Blindness and Deafness, or Tasha's Hideous Laughter. Those are just her spells. She has other actions as well. When she attacks in combat, she can make three attacks per turn. She can bite you with her iron teeth and slap you around with her pestle from the mortar and pestle that she flies around on. The pestle deals 68 plus 4 bludgeoning damage. People need to pass on a DC 20 constitution saving throw if they're hit with this thing or have disadvantage on concentration checks until the end of their next turn, so she's really good against spellcasters. If her iron teeth are in her mouth, then she can bite you for 60, 10 plus four piercing damage, and you need to pass a wisdom saving throw or be frightened of Baba Yaga. I think I'm frightened already. Finally, she has a horrifying move called Breath of the Bone Mother, which is very like a dragon's breath attack. It recharges on a five or six of a d6 at the start of her turn, where she exhales a 40 foot cone that we are told is a great wind that smells of fetid mires and sausages from her mouth, and those within this rancid cone need to make a DC 18 constitution saving throw, or take 10d8 necrotic damage, and you are affected by the bestow curse spell for one minute. This stinking cloud, we're told to use the rules for stinking cloud here, then drifts around and only dissipates after 1d4 rounds. That Breath of the Bone Mother is also one of her legendary actions, it costs two actions actually, and her pestle slap is another one of those three legendary actions. But she also gets a reaction that she can use once a day called Dance of the Time Taunter, which says that when Baba Yaga's turn ends, she can take an additional turn. A creature able to see Baba Yaga dance through time has its understanding of the universe challenged and must succeed on a DC 18 intelligence saving throw or be stunned until the end of its next turn. And that's just Baba herself. Her teeth have their own rules. It's only a challenge rating too, but on top of everything else, that's going to be a real pain to fight. It's its own spellcast. It can cast things like Detect Magic, Mending, Ray of Frost, True Strike, Grease, Magic Missile, Shield, Acid Arrow, Blur, and Heat Metal, as well as obviously Bite You. But it doesn't cause the fear thing when it does. But I believe you're getting the picture. Do not mess with Baba Yaga unless you have a real cause to. She is a terrifying thing to fight, and she's just as terrifying in her mythology. So. I hope you enjoyed today's video. I definitely enjoyed recording this, I definitely enjoyed drawing Baba Yaga, and I hope Tigeress's Slavic mythology lust is sated for a few more videos. If you did enjoy this video, please make sure to leave it a little thumbs up down below. Perhaps favorite it and share it with the rest of your party. 
everything that you can do like that really does tangibly help this channel. So thank you very much if you choose to. If you want to see more videos like this every single week, I release another video on every Monday. And I do that thanks to the help of my patrons over on Patreon, who are lucky enough to receive rewards like every single one of my monster drawings that I draw each month. If you'd like a copy of this drawing, please make sure to head over to Patreon and check that out. But they also get things like one-on-one -on -one chats, Patreon live streams, and other things like that. So if you choose to go over there, I'd very much appreciate your help. Thank you very, very much if you do. If not, then at least try to avoid terrifying old women who dwell in swamps, smelling of corpses and borscht. And until next time, happy monster hunting. Yeah.